Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us today for this, the second of VIU's Arts and Humanities Colloquiums for fall 2017. I'm Dr. Tim Lewis, the chair of the VIU History Department, and it's my pleasure to serve as a host for each of the colloquium events this year. I want to begin by acknowledging that we have the great honor today of meeting on the traditional territory of the Sunemo First Nation. Please always be appreciative of that fact, and when the opportunity arises, do whatever you can to further the process of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Now, as you know, the topic for today's event is, it's the end of the world as we know it. Archetypal narratives, the epic of Gilgamesh, and the fate of civilization. And I must say that Dr. Anna Atkinson, who is our presenter today, was particularly insistent about doing this colloquium talk. Indeed, she virtually hounded the members of the colloquium planning committee day after day, week after week. She just had to give this talk. I don't know, it was, it was like there was no tomorrow. Uh, ha, 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 ha. There, there you go, of course. That was an entirely fictional little story told solely to set up that very small joke. Um, yeah, I can assure you that Anna followed all the normal pro protocol in terms of getting this topic on our agenda. In fact, we were hounding her to, to do it as, as opposed to anything else. Now, uh, I'm about to introduce to you Dr. Tony Smith, who will in turn be introducing Anna this morning, but I do have one serious piece of business to raise first. <clears throat> I'm sad to say that this might well be the last Arts and Humanities Colloquium ever to be presented. Or at least it would be if it weren't for the generous uh, moral and financial support pr provided by the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Ross McKay. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. <clears throat> and his highly efficient administrative team, when it comes to the end of the colloquium's world, Ross McKay is always there to save our day. Yay! <clears throat> Okay, so now that you know that the colloquium will not be ending anytime soon, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tony Smith, who will tell us a bit more about this morning's speaker, her friend and colleague in, from VIU's Department of English, Dr. Anna Atkinson. Tony Smith, everyone. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here this morning to introduce my good friend and colleague from the English department, Dr. Anna Atkinson. Um, Anna is a farmer, a singer of the traditional songs of the British Isles, a permaculture designer, a fiber artist, an amateur naturalist, and a scholar of colonial, and Amer sorry, colonial American and biblical literature. She received her honors BA from the University of Calgary and her MA and PhD in English from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She taught at Queen's and at the Royal Military College in Kingston before returning to her roots here in Nanaimo where she was born. She and her husband, Robert Pepper Smith, live on a 20 acre permaculture farm south of Nanaimo. And she and I are collaborating on a book project on back to the land movements. Um, we were drawn to this topic by our shared pull towards back to the land movements ourselves as farmers and gardeners, particularly in, uh, in response to shared concerns about climate change, depleting resources, and community resilience. These concerns led us inevitably down a rabbit hole partially occupied by those declaring that this is actually the end of the world as we know it. Observing this discussion and its patterns of discourse led Anna to the startling re recognition that she had seen these patterns before. They were eerily similar to patterns she noticed in her colonial American literature and other studies. I thought this was a brilliant insight and uh, these have become key concepts that are shaping our understanding of why people continue to believe that going back to the land is the appropriate response to civilization. It turns out, Anna tells us, that these archetypal narratives of epic, romance, and tragedy, shaped by the stories we tell ourselves, are present even in the earliest literary work, the Epic of Gilgamesh. I know nothing about the Epic of Gilgamesh, so I'm very eager to hear what it has to say about the fate of our civilization. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anna Atkinson.
Thank you so much. I'd like to echo the thanks given to Dr. Ross McKay as Dean of Arts and Humanities for his support for this project, and also to Roz Davies and the rest of the staff in the Arts and Humanities uh, office for, for their support as well. Thank you to Tony Smith for her lovely introduction, most of which I probably don't deserve, and to Tim as well for, um, for introducing the colloquium as a whole. And thank each and one, every one of you for being here today um, on this very rainy day that seems perhaps like at least the end of the summer. So my talk today centers on the connections between epic as an archetypal genre, civilization as a social construction, and the end of the world as we know it, which I argue can be predicted by a critical examination of epic, civilization, and the way in which these two things interact. Now interestingly, the genesis of this project came from an examination of an entirely different archetypal genre, the romance. Now, by romance, I don't mean the intimate relationship between two consenting adults. Rather, I'm using the term very technically to indicate a particular type of narrative involving a quest and the obtaining of an object whose value is both inestimable and, like everything else in an archetypal narrative, deeply symbolic. Perhaps the best Western cult uh, European cultural shorthand for the romance might be summed up in the quest for the Holy Grail. If we were to draw a stylized image of the romance as a narrative pattern, this is what we would see. It took me two hours to make that slide. <laughs> that big circle is actually a wall, a wall surrounding a building with its own walls. There's a door in the wall, or a gate if you like. There may be a moat as well, but the walls here are key. So is the little fellow on the horse. The horse is optional, but the hero is not. Here's how romance works, and I'm paraphrasing freely from the late great Canadian statesman of English literature, Northrop Frye. The place within the walls, which is virtually always a city or court of some sort, is seen at the outset of the romance to be somehow lacking. The word that best describes this lack is sterility. The sterility may be physical, there may have been a drought, there may be threat of famine, but it is equally often moral or spiritual. Key values have been abandoned and a moral decay has set in. The hero, who tends to be divinely inspired, though fully mortal, realizes that there is one thing needful to set right what has gone wrong inside the walls. But this needful thing lies outside the walls, in the so-called green world, filled with dangerous forests, wild beasts, and sometimes even wilder humans. The hero sets forth, in spite of the danger, ventures into the green world, which is in direct contrast to the sterile world within walls, finds the thing of great worth, and brings it back. What gets brought back in most narratives is deeply symbolic of fertility. It may be a cup or grail representing a womb, or perhaps even a princess with an actual womb, thus at least temporarily remedying the problem of sterility within the walls. But this led to a question for me. Where did the walls come from, and why were they there? Symbolically speaking, if there were no walls, they wouldn't have to be breached, and that would save a lot of time and effort. As it turns out, the epic actually defines, describes, and explains exactly how those walls get built and why. So first, a little bit about the epic. Some of the time, the word epic just gets used to describe something, often a story, like a film, that is really grand or really long. But epic, like romance, has a much more technical definition. The epic, as any number of introductions to literature or glossaries of literary terms will tell you, is a long, formal narrative with a serious subject and a set of specific conventions and a central figure who is quasi-divine, whose actions have a particular cultural purpose. To embody the values of a civilization and to determine the fate of that civilization. The reason the epic is so long and so formal is that it is ritual in nature, as the quasi-divine status of its hero suggests. The fact that the hero embodies the values of the civilization and determines its fate gives us a clue to the overarching role of the epic 
And that is simply this. To paraphrase part of David Quint's monumental book, Epic and Empire, epic defines a civilization. More than this, epic defines civilization as a whole. Cultures that are not defined by civilization as a social structure do not, on the whole, have epics. Civilizations, pretty nearly universally, do. I'm going to define civilization the way I'm using it in this talk a bit later, but first I want to make two more points about the epic. The first point is this. Along with defining civilization, or civilization as a whole, and its values, the epic and its hero have one further job. The story of the epic and the epic hero's actions profoundly affect the people of the civilization to which they belong by revealing something very important about life and death. We're going to return to this point a bit later. The second additional point is this. Because the epic is such a formal piece of writing, there are particular characteristics associated with it. At times, these can seem almost template-like. Aristotle described six characteristics, fable, action, characters, sentiments, diction, and meter. But here's a more concrete list. It begins with a statement or theme or argument. Supernatural beings take an interest or even an active role. The hero is of great national or even cosmic importance. The setting is huge. The action involves battles and or superhuman deeds. There are often lists of things, objects or possessions. And one example is the hero's armors, armor and weapons. What's especially interesting about these conventions is that they all, in one way or another, support the actual purpose of the epic defining civilization. The statement of theme is almost an apologetic, that is, an excuse for what follows. The intervention of supernatural beings marks the civilization and what it represents as divinely ordained. The national, even, even cosmic, importance of the hero emphasizes the importance of individuality, a point we'll be returning to as critical to civilizations. The huge setting and battles with superhuman deeds once again suggests the cosmic importance of the events and the rightness of the narrative's outcome. The list of things emphasizes the accumulation of wealth and with it status, which civilizations tend to depend on for their social organization. The formality and performative nature of the epic add to its ritual nature, and rituals are one way to reinforce cultural norms. While it's true that an epic may evolve out of a culture's shared stories, the story itself eventually becomes normative. It becomes not only a story of the way things are, but the way they naturally are, by which is meant the way they should be. I'm going to illustrate all of this by making my way into the oldest epic we have, indeed the oldest piece of literature we currently know about, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here are the first words, and I'm using N.K. Sandar's translation here. I will proclaim to the world the deeds of Gilgamesh. This was the man to whom all things were known. This was the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise. He saw mysteries and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor. Returning, he rested. He engraved this on a stone the whole story. The first sentence is, in a sense, the statement of theme or argument. This story is about the deeds of Gilgamesh. But it's true of any biography, which this purports to be, that the deeds reported are carefully selected and edited. And it's key that the first deed we have here, the primary deed, has to do with engraving something on stone or writing. Not only that, what is being engraved on stone is specifically history. Now let's have a look at the next deed reported. In Uruk, he built walls, a great rampart, and the temp temple of blessed Aana for the god of the firmament Anu, and for Ishtar, the goddess of love. Look at it still today. Touch the threshold, it is ancient. Approach Aana, the dwelling of Ishtar, our lady of love and war, the like of which no latter-day king, no man alive, can equal. 
Now, Gilgamesh's knowledge of mysteries and secret things in the previous slide supports his status as in some way more than human. And this is enhanced by his description a bit later in the story. He is physically perfect, has been given beauty by one god, courage by a second, and is even described as two-thirds god and one-third man. So why, then? Why start the epic by describing Gilgamesh not as a conqueror or a warrior, but as a writer, an engineer, and an architect? What's the significance of writing things down and building walls? To answer this question, we first have to ask what architecture and writing together tend to define. The answer to this is quite simple, civilization. The reasons for this are several. First, writing insists on an understanding of the world as having linear rather than mythic history. It speaks of times past, but in a way that has a strong tendency to both concretize and linearize. That is, history, especially written history, is understood to be different from myth in that it can be securely located in time. At least, that's the theory. The reality is much more complex, as any historian will tell you. And while oral cultures can keep track of time in ways that are actually dizzying to cultures that rely on literacy, the fact is that once a culture begins relying on literacy, its history tends to become more and more exclusively concrete and linear. And civilizations always exist in linear time. In part, this is because of the presence of architecture. So the second point here is that architecture changes how we perceive time. Buildings age. Monuments age. Sometimes they even fall down. All of this creates the impression that the primary and natural progression of time is linear. However, this is not the natural way to see things if buildings are not present or are not of primary importance. There are other ways to see time's primary movement, cyclical, for example, or even spiral. These ways are hard to hang on to in the presence of buildings, or to some extent, writing. Third, architecture on a city scale takes up a lot of space. This allows for an accumulation of goods and wealth, and this tends to lead to social structure that is inherently hierarchical. It also allows for luxury based on that hierarchy. The people lower on the hierarchy work harder physically. The higher you are, the less physical work you do, and the highest classes do nothing at all. All that accumulation and luxury are patently impossible without a place to store your stuff and a lifestyle that is restricted in its mobility because it's too hard to carry all that stuff with you. This is what leads to what's commonly called civilization. That is, a type of social organization based on living in cities. We tend to use this word now to refer to common and accepted social practices or the lack of them. People who behave badly are called uncivilized. But in fact, there are many moral and ethical and beautiful and deeply complex cultures which do not rely on cities for their social makeup. These are cultures, but not technically civilizations. Civilizations are identifiable by their cities and not, incidentally, by their good manners, ethics, or morals. To return to the idea of accumulation of wealth and social stratification, when you add to these things the fact that there is a concentration of population in an urban environment, you come up against a further definition of civilization. It is something which has a built-in tendency to outgrow its land base. Civilizations tend to increase in both size and complexity, but as they do, they consume more resources and are inherently unsustainable because of this. Derek Jensen is a philosopher and author who has recently had a lot to say about this, and I owe my definition here largely to his work, in particular his recent two-volume work, Endgame. But Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West noted something similar back in 1919. And Jared Diamond and Joseph Tainter have written extensively on aspects of civilization that parallel what I've said here more recently. So has Ronald Wright, Canada's Massey lecture speaker in 2005. The basic premise, though, 
is that if you don't live within the ecological constraints of the land you live on, you won't live all that long. So when we examine the first two deeds of Gilgamesh, we see that what is privileged here are the two harbingers of civilization, writing and cities, which are defined in his time by their walls. There's something else about those walls that deserves scrutiny. They have ramparts. This implies defense, which in turn implies war. War is a natural, in fact, inevitable result of outgrowing your land base, because your land base is also your resource base. If you overuse it, it wears out and you have to find some more. If someone else's wears out, they will have to find more and you'll have to defend yours if they decide they want to keep it. It's not that there isn't war without cities or civilizations, it's that civilizations have a natural tendency to live beyond their means in terms of resources, which leads to a tendency toward making war. In fact, most wars are fundamentally about resources. There's a significance to the gods mentioned at this early stage of the narrative, too. In this context, Ishtar is particularly interesting. She is the goddess of love, lust, beauty, and, as the quotation indicates, war. This may seem an odd combination, but lust is another word for appetite, that is, the drive for the acquisition of resources. And this develops inherently in cities and civilizations, as I've already noted. Thus, although the connection between lust and war might seem counterintuitive, really it isn't. It's interesting that the very next thing we hear about Gilgamesh is that he's causing a lot of trouble in the city he has built. Surprisingly, the trouble seems to be that he is what we would call uncivilized. The men of Uruk muttered in their houses, Gilgamesh sounds the toxin for his amusement. His arrogance knows no bounds by day or night. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all, even the children. Yet the king should be a shepherd to his people. His lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the chief of the noble. Yet this is the shepherd of the city? While Gilgamesh's actions are not conducive to peaceful life in a city, there is no question, given what I've just said about civilization, that they are indeed indicative of exactly what civilization tends to encourage. It's interesting to note here the number of ways in which Gilgamesh, after setting up the boundaries of the city, goes about violating boundaries within it. This is part of lust, of appetite, of desire for various resources, some of which may not be your own. Thus, Gilgamesh has built a city, but lacks the restraint to live civilly there, let alone rule. The establishment of boundaries which are crucial to the definition of the city and civilization, unfortunately, don't seem to have transferred to Gilgamesh's understanding of how he should behave while living there. The point here seems to be that Gilgamesh cannot separate the wild, that is, the unbounded part of himself, from the civil the one that depends on boundaries. It's key to note here that unrestrainedness is only bad if you have to live within city limits, with limited resources, and for example, in a hierarchy where your unrestrained appetites impinge on others due to your sense of entitlement and privilege. So it's necessary in a civilization to restrain some of those impulses and appetites. But the problem with restraining the unbounded or wild part of ourselves and our world, as we'll see, is that the wild part is also the part that is most creative and fertile. Gilgamesh's actions here also indicate an inherent selfishness, a mode of action that has the effect of separation from others. This is a fairly natural outgrowth of the process of civilization that I've outlined. First, the city is built involving architecture that allows for the accumulation of resources. Then resources are accumulated, but because the city is always already too big for its land base, there is a dearth. This means that the accumulation is not likely to happen evenly, which creates a wealth gap. This in turn creates a social hierarchy, which is in turn deeply implicated in the rise of individualism. If we think about individualism as the self separating from others and insisting that this self, myself, is the most important self there is, 
an essential idea in the context of social hierarchy, then we can see how separation is something that begins with the walls between the city and what forever after is defined as wild and ends with the walls that separate us from each other. There's one further point to make here. Gilgamesh is necessary. Without him, the city or civilization would not have been built. But he's also semi-divine and thus exceptional. And this is part of the normalization of individualism. But he is not entirely at home or at ease in a civilized world as a result. Nor is civilization entirely at ease with him. Civilizations need bureaucrats, not semi-divine heroes. Gilgamesh is a problem. The gods find the solution to Gilgamesh in Enkidu, a companion made especially for him, who may or may not have looked something like this. Why is Enkidu the solution? Well, Enkidu is the archetypal wild man, and we'll see that in his description in a moment. But he is also Gilgamesh's shadow, his other self. Bringing the two of them together formalizes Gilgamesh's wild side and contains it in his mirror image, which is both himself and his opposite. As the gods say to Aruru, the goddess of creation, you made him, now create his equal. Let it be like him as his own reflection, his second self. The description of this second self is telling. His body was rough. He had long hair like a woman's. It waved like the hair of Nisaba, the goddess of corn. His body was covered with matted hair like Samarkand's, the god of cattle. He was innocent of mankind. He knew nothing of the cultivated land. In any number of ways, Enkidu clashes with cultural norms and disrupts boundaries, which is what walls represent. He has long hair like a woman, disturbing gender boundaries, or even like a plant, disturbing the boundaries between kinds of being. His body is hairy like an animal. He is innocent but uncultivated. He is the personification in many ways of wildness and everything that the walls of Uruk, with their t emphasis on order, separation, and compartmentalization, define a society against. Interestingly, as the text later points out, he is joyful, but almost immediately. Before Enkidu meets Gilgamesh, indeed before he even has contact with the city, there is conflict because Enkidu associates much more closely with the wild than with civilization. A civilization that is clearly making inroads into the wilds here as we are about to learn because the conflict comes in the form of an encounter with a trapper. But there was a trapper who met him one day face to face at the drinking hole, for the wild game had entered his territory. The trapper was frozen with fear. He was dumb, benumbed with terror. When the trapper regains his speech, he describes Enkidu in terms that echo in many ways the description of Gilgamesh. He is the strongest in the world. He is like an immortal from heaven. He ranges through your land and comes down to the wells. I'm afraid and dare not go near him. But the trapper's complaint against Enkidu and the source of his fear is very specific. He fills in the pits which I dig and tears up my traps set for the game. He helps the beast to escape and now they slip through my fingers. Enkidu stops the trapper from using the wild animals as a resource. Thus, Enkidu works against the ability of the city or civilization to look after itself and actually protects the resources from the wild from extraction by the city. Clearly, he's a threat to the city, and indeed the city dwellers agree that he needs to be neutralized. Interestingly, it is a woman who conquers Enkidu and not Gilgamesh, at least not immediately. Women were, indeed still are associated with civilization through what is known as domestic life. Now this woman's taming of Enkidu occurs through sex. For six days and seven nights they lay together, for Enkidu had forgotten his home in the hills, but when he was satisfied, he went back to the wild beasts. I'll forbear making any comment there. What the repercussions of this event end up emphasizing more than anything else is the binary that has developed between the inside and outside, between city and not city, between civilization and wilderness. And I'd just like to point out that without 
a wall around the city. There is no wilderness. There's just a place where you live. It's the actual building of the city and the imposition of those walls that creates the definition both of civilization and of wilderness. Wilderness is actually a thought concept, not a real thing. So back to Enkidu. In joining with the woman, particularly she, since she is a temple acolyte and thus associated not only with domesticity, but with city architecture specifically, Enkidu has symbolically joined with civilization, a part of the system that needs to exploit the wild. This is why the beasts who were formerly Enkidu's intimate friends now reject him. Then when the gazelles saw him, they bolted away. When the wild creatures saw him, they fled. Enkidu would have followed, but his body was bound as though with a cord. His knees gave way when he started to run. His swiftness was gone. And now the wild creatures had all fled away, and Enkidu had grown weak, for wisdom was in him. You might wonder, given the six days and seven nights of sex, why the narrative seems to feel the need to explain Enkidu's sudden weakness. You could also be forgiven for questioning why what Enkidu is said to have gained by all this is something called wisdom. One answer here is that what constitutes wisdom is entirely ideologically driven. What is called wisdom in civilization, for example, might seem like foolishness or even craziness in a culture that uses a different social model. Thus, one way to decode what is happening here is that Enkidu is learning a different ideology. This particular ideology seems to come at a price, weakness. This actually makes more sense than it might at first appear to. Separation from the wild often results in weakness, since the wild is the source of all things. More of that in a moment. But this weakness and this separation is what makes the walls of a rook necessary. Enkidu serves as an example. To put it simply, it is demonstrably true that not all wild animals are vegetarian. Some of them find humans quite tasty. Enkidu does not need to worry about this so long as he lives in a way that is peculiarly unindividuated. And again, more of that in a moment. However, when he joins with civilization and separates from the wild, that is, when individualism becomes part of his worldview, suddenly it seems a lot like wisdom to get behind a nice set of stone walls with the lions on the other side. In fact, Enkidu, when he is fully assimilated into civilization, completely changes his allegiance. By the time the whole process of civilizing him has ended, he hunts wild beasts and protects the herdsmen. That civilization process takes place during one of the strangest scenes in this part of the epic, the one where Enkidu has to learn to eat. They put down bread in front of him, but Enkidu could only suck the milk of wild animals. He fumbled and gaped at a loss what to do or how he should eat the bread and drink the strong wine. Then the woman said, Enkidu, eat bread. It is the staff of life. Drink the wine. It is the custom of the land. So he ate till he was full and drank strong wine, seven goblets. He became merry. His heart exulted and his face shone. He rubbed down the matted hair of his body and anointed himself with oil. Enkidu had become a man. That previously Enkidu knew only how to suck the milk of wild animals is signal. Not only is this an association with the wild, it's also an association with infancy before individuation. Tip of the hat to Freud. There is a connection to a resource, a source of nourishment that not only breaches bodily boundaries, but also crosses the boundary here between species, thus completely disturbing both the idea of the separate individual, something that civilizations rely on, and the idea of humans as naturally separate from nature. There's more to note here. Milk is a child's food. Bread and wine are adult foods. And Enkidu must learn to be an adult. That is, to lose the innocence of childhood and take on the responsibilities of civil life. Or at least, that's how civilization sees it. Civilizations are always convinced that they are more evolved and advanced than the cultures around them which are not civilized. And so images of infantilization are disturbingly common. But there's one more thing about these different foods. The milk is absolutely and completely 
uncultivated, uncultured, and unprocessed. Not so bread and wine, whose source plants must be carefully grown and then harvested and then processed thoroughly to produce the foodstuffs. Plain grain, and to some extent plain grapes, are much less useful as foods. Grapes spoil, and unprocessed wheat is unpalatable. Thus, civilization also insists on cultivated plants and a type of industrial processing. Agriculture, both plant and animal, is foundational to civilization. Again, in terms of resources, this makes sense because there aren't enough wild gazelles, for example, who are willing to share their milk with you. More seriously, a concentrated urban population cannot survive on the kinds of dispersed resources that the wilds produce. Rather, they need concentrated sources of food within a very limited distance from the city, preferably ones that don't run away. As to how sustainable agriculture is or can be, the plain fact is that so far, several civilizations have fallen due to the unsustainable nature of their agricultural practices. The Mayan and Sumerian are two. Arguably, Western culture should have suffered the same fate for the same reason quite some time ago, but the addition to petro of petroleum to the system has forestalled that inevitable end. But back to Gilgamesh. The section of the Epic of Gilgamesh I've been examining here ends with Gilgamesh having two dreams. In the first, a meteor falls out of the sky in front of him, he can't lift it by himself, but can with the assistance of his people. For this meteor, he feels attraction, like the love for woman. In a second dream, he dreams of an axe, and again has feelings for it, like the love of a woman. Both these items, we are told, symbolize Enkidu, who is soon to arrive, and whom Gilgamesh will eventually fight, defeat, and befriend. In these dreams, we return to where we started in the explanation of Enkidu. He is Gilgamesh, but only the wild side of him. In the company of others, Gilgamesh can control Enkidu. Indeed, he must. What he feels for what Enkidu represents is desire. We can see this as a psychological desire for a part of the self, but it's equally true that in this case, Gilgamesh's desire is symbol, symbolic of civilization's appetite for those things that only the wildlands can produce, since the city, as we've established, is always already too big for its geographical footprint. So, Enkidu becomes domestic, and Gilgamesh becomes more civil. We arrive in chapter two of the epic having established a civilization. There is a city, and there are walls, and these are concrete evidence of civilization, but the walls don't just separate civilization and the wildlands, they define civilization in opposition to wilderness. Further, Gilgamesh's subordination of Enkidu, friendly though it ends up being, is also symbolic of the need for civilization to subdue and subordinate those wildlands outside the walls, and even, in Enkidu's case, enlist their support of the wilds for civilization. The need for this has to do with the problems inherent with civilization. I've already alluded to problem one. The difference between civilization and wilderness or the wildlands is that the wildlands renew themselves quite naturally. If you look at ruins in a jungle, you'll see the contrast that I'm gesturing toward. Without constant attention and maintenance, civilizations and buildings like those of Uruk or here Tikal tend to fall down to disappear, and thus, in a way, to die, once again reinforcing the idea of linear time. The forest, on the other hand, and the wildlands in general, are constantly in a state of renewal. That is, they represent in a very real way a kind of eternal life that isn't open to architecture. So it's not surprising that Gilgamesh's first concern in chapter two is that he is not granted eternal life. As the son of a goddess, he might have expected this, but he is not going to have those expectations met. Symbolically, he cannot. He is also the representative of civilization. And the separation from the eternally renewing life of the wild means that death is inevitable. This is what Enkidu, delivering the message of the god Shamash, says to him. The father of the gods has given you kingship. Such is your destiny. Everlasting life is not your destiny. Because of this, do not be grieved or oppressed. 
He has given you the power to bind or loose, to be the darkness or the light of mankind. He has given you unexampled supremacy over the people, victory in battle from which no fugitive returns, in forays and assaults from which there is no going back. The price paid for supremacy over people, that is, civilization and social hierarchy, the power to bind or loose, or the law, and victory in battle, access to resources of others in order to, in order to maintain your own civilization, is the loss of the kind of eternal life that the wild world contains. This actually makes a lot of sense because the kind of eternal life that the wilds contain is not the eternal life of individuals, but of the system as a whole. This comes from the fact that wildlands ecologically, even today, hold a balance which may shift and change, but if left uninterfered with, is always self-correcting and self-limiting. No one individual lives forever. Even species may naturally go extinct, but the wilds remain alive. Nothing is allowed to grow too large for the system to support. But the whole point of civilization is that it grows larger than its systems can support. This is why its system is predicated on the practice of either raiding other civilizations or exploiting the so-called wildlands in order to make up that deficit. If you think about it, you'll see that this is true today, both in situations of war and in situations of ecological destruction. The other thing to note here is that civilization is also predicated on separation, hence the walls, as I've noted. Not only the separation between the city and the wildlands, though, but also between us as individuals. When the individual becomes the most important social unit rather than the collective, then death becomes far more frightening. If the collective is important, then what is important is that it should continue. If the individual is what is important, then what becomes important to the individual is that he or she should continue. This leads to all kinds of silly behaviors, like burying huge amounts of stuff with you to take on your voyage to the afterlife. However, these silly behaviors also provide a good bit of evidence concerning the huge importance of separation, individuation, and the expression of this through the accumulation of wealth and consequent social status. That's the first problem with civilization. The second problem seems almost paradoxical. It stems not from a dearth of resources, but rather from an excess. Luxury is a hallmark of civilization, but one of the things it produces is idleness. In doing this, luxury robs us of life and strength, both physically and spiritually. Who better to express this than Enkidu, the wild man who has become not only civilized, but domestic? The eyes of Enkidu were full of tears, and his heart was sick. He sighed bitterly, and Gilgamesh met his eye and said, My friend, why do you sigh so bitterly? But Enkidu opened his mouth and said, I am weak. My arms have lost their strength. The cry of sorrow sticks in my throat. I am oppressed by idleness. So basically, he's bored. These two problems, embedded as they are in the very fabric of the epic's narrative, affirm that there are key problems with civilization as a system. We might actually identify the problems I've just described as types of physical and or moral sterility. These are the problems that the romance as an archetypal narrative pattern identify in a civilization. So it's not surprising that at this point, the Epic of Gilgamesh begins to look a lot more like a romance, right down to the suddenly, clearly mortal hero nature of the hero. This is because Gilgamesh has a solution for all of this, and for his solution, he immediately turns his thoughts to the country of the living, which is also known as the land of cedars, that is, the forest, also known in the romance as the green world, perhaps the most majestic of wild lands. Life comes from the forest and from other wild places. It makes sense to look for the solution to sterility there, but it's important to note that civilizations, and Gilgamesh's is no exception, have a very strong tendency to operate only within their own ideological parameters, which are separation, conflict, subordination, and the control of resources. This actually becomes plain quite quickly since Gilgamesh's plan immediately involves the identification of an enemy, whom he describes as evil in the land. 
Because of the evil that is in the land, he says, we will go to the forest and destroy the evil. For in the forest lives Humbaba, whose name is Hugeness, a fierce giant. Enlil has appointed Humbaba to guard the forest and armed him in sevenfold terrors. What is this evil? The forest guardian Humbaba. Why is Humbaba evil? He is the being who guards the forest, the one who stands in the way of Gilgamesh cutting down the cedars. Cedars here are highly symbolic of wealth. They were, in this place and time, among the rarest of resources. They even, because of their great age, tended to symbolize life itself. They were also a luxury product, the rough equivalent of gold or ivory, and only available to the very rich. Gilgamesh is very rich. Thus, what is evil, according to Gilgamesh, is that which withholds from him resources to which, because of his wealth and privilege, he feels entitled. Proving that entitlement is going to mean a battle with the one who guards them. This sense of entitlement to resources and the willingness to fight someone to get them is, as I've said, the cause of virtually all armed geopolitical conflict or war. War, incidentally, is also a cure for idleness in the luxury classes, which is probably one reason Gilgamesh immediately thinks of it when Enkidu complains of being weak due to idleness. To return to the issue of the proposed quest to the land of the, the country of the living, what Gilgamesh is planning to contest here is whether he or the forest has rights to the forest's resources. To do this, he invokes the aid of the god Shamash, the sun god, the god of justice, and in general, the god who best represents the concept of civilization. The invocation to Shamash and Shamash's endorsement of the venture certainly help to suggest that Gilgamesh and Enkidu are on the side of righteousness here, which tends also to endorse Gilgamesh's identification of the forest guardian as evil. But there's a further concept at issue. Gilgamesh isn't just after the resources. I've mentioned the fact that when the individual is seen as primary, then death becomes frightening, and Gilgamesh has just been told that he will eventually die. Thus, what Gilgamesh is looking for in the land of the living is a kind of eternal life that will somehow compensate for this mortality. Fame. On the land of the cedars, Lord Gilgamesh reflected, he said to his servant Enkidu, I have not established my name stamped on bricks as my destiny decreed. Therefore, I will go to the country where the cedar is felled. I will set up my name in the place where the names of famous men are written. And where no man's name is written yet, I will raise a monument to the gods. So interestingly, what Gilgamesh offers the gods in return for this fame is also a form of eternal life, gifts and worship. Without worshippers and offerings, the point of being a god is rather lost. In fact, Neil Gaiman's 2001 novel, American Gods, uses this as its basic premise. Without people to believe in them, gods cease to have power, perhaps cease to exist. The epic tells of several adventures and a series of dreams that Gilgamesh and Enkidu have en route to the land of the living. But in the end, they arrive and meet the fearsome forest guardian, Humbaba. To cut a long story short, they defeat him rather dramatically. When they do this, the earth itself shakes, understandably, since the earth has just lost a protector. Because the epic is a formal and ritualistic narrative, it takes a long time for it to relate the tale of what happens next, so I'm just going to summarize. Gilgamesh and Enkidu cut down some trees. Actually, they cut down all the trees. This fight was never about good and evil. It was, never ab it was always about what even now tends to make you famous. Resources, wealth, luxury, conquest of nature, and therefore, separation from nature. If this sounds like the Kardashians, it should. Although there are another couple of sections in the epic following the forest battle that are in some ways pertinent to what I'm gonna talk about next, in the interest of time, we're gonna skip ahead because the forest battle itself is enough to answer the question of why one of our heroes, so the gods decide, must be sacrificed. Anu, Enlil, Ea, and Heavenly Shamash took counsel together, and Anu said to Enlil, because they have killed Humbaba, who guarded the cedar mountain, one of the two must die. 
The question of why one of them must die is answered in part by the fact that Enkidu ends up being the sacrifice. So first, to review, the two heroes have now destroyed an entire forest and a sacred symbol of the power of nature. It seems only right that some compensation should be paid. But beyond this, what's been destroyed is the natural and wild world. This is what civilization does. In its sense of entitlement to the resources of the wild world, and in its separation and thus lack of comprehension of how those resources work, it kills that which is natural, wild, and fertile, while extracting the resources it feels entitled to and which are necessary for the continuation of itself. But it also kills that which is natural, wild, and fertile within itself as a result, because the separation between wild and civilized is only a human construction after all. Enkidu is the part of the Gilgamesh-Enkidu hero complex that represents that wild nature. Thus, it seems only natural that if Gilgamesh and civilization are to remain an increase, Enkidu and the representation of the wild must die. This is how civilizations grow. Enkidu's lament when he realizes he is going to die is signal. While Enkidu lay alone in his sickness, he cursed the cedar gate as though it was living flesh. You there, wood of the gate, I searched for you over 20 leagues. There is no wood like you in our land. 72 cubits high and 24 wide. The pivot and the ferrule and the jams are perfect, but oh, if I had known the conclusion, if I had known that this was all the good that would come of it, I would have set up here a gate of wattle instead. Had Enkidu known the results of his actions, that is, had he been able to predict the result of cutting the cedars and building this massive monument would be his own death, he would never have gone to get the cedar, but would have put up a wattle gate instead. A cedar gate requires that you cut down the whole tree, but a wattle gate requires only branches woven together. It's a poor gate. It does not support hierarchy. No trees are killed in the making of wattle structures. They are, if thoughtfully done, entirely sustainable. But they are very humble. Enkidu has more to say. He next curses the trapper. Enkidu raised his head and wept before the sun god. In the brilliance of the sunlight, his tears streamed down. Sun god, I beseech you, about that vile trapper, let him catch least. Make his game scarce. Make him feeble, taking the smaller of every share. Let his quarry escape from his nets. This is a curse on the very representative of civilization who first initiated the series of events which led to Enkidu's separation from the wild and thus from the eternal life that the wild offers. His curse affects the trapper's ability to inf interact successfully with civilization. The trapper will not be able to accumulate wealth or status. Enkidu then curses the woman whom he feels ensnares him, ensnared him, and the shape of that curse is also telling. As for you, woman, with a great curse I curse you. Your hire shall be the potter's earth. Your thievings will be flung into the hovel. You will sit at the crossroads in the dust of the potter's quarter. You will make your bed on the dunghill at night, and by day take your stand in the wall's shadow. Brambles and thorns will tear at your feet. The drunk and the dry will strike at your cheek, and your mouth will ache. Let you be stripped of your purple dyes, for I too, once in the wilderness, had all the treasure I wanted. Because of the woman, Enkidu has become a part of civilization, from which he is now being expelled by death. Whereas once he was part of the wild, from whence he was expelled because of his domestication through the woman. What he curses her with is the same fate. She is to be outsides of civilization, crossroads are outside city walls, and she is even to stand within the wall's shadow. But she will also be rejected, even injured by nature itself. Brambles and thorns will tear at her. This particular curse seems fairly predictable. Chercher la femme has a long history. What is perhaps less predictable at this point is the god Shemash's intervention. When Shemash heard the words of Enkidu, he called to him from heaven, Enkidu, why are you cursing the woman, the mistress who taught you to eat bread fit for God, gods and drink the wine of kings? She who put upon you a magnificent garment, did she not give you 
the glorious Gilgamesh for your companion, and has not Gilgamesh, your own brother, made you rest on a royal bed and recline on a couch at his left hand? He has made the princes of the earth kiss your feet, and now all the people of Uruk lament and wail over you. Shemesh is the god of civilization, so of course he has a vested interest in defending it. More than this, though, what Shemesh is reminding Enkidu of is that he has not lost everything by becoming civilized. There have been gains as well, and those would not have been possible without that civilization process started by the woman. In abandoning the wild, Enkidu has gained individualism, agriculture, industry, wealth, possessions, rank, status, and luxury. This is civilization. So is isolation, ecological ruin, poverty, dearth, depression, destitution, and death, especially the fear of it. There is an exchange here. An Enkidu has not been treated unfairly. In the end, his decisions were his own. So are ours. The vision that Enkidu has of the afterlife is a good place to close for today. What he sees there is exactly what he most feared. The dead sit in the dark and eat dirt. They are servants rather than masters, but what is worse, they do not seem to be themselves at all. Their identity has been absorbed, it seems, into the earth itself. This is perfectly natural and normal, and in the wild, both acceptable and unfrightening. The whole does not die. And the individual is meaningless when extracted from this whole. Moreover, each death absorbed back into the earth which gives life substance is the beginning of new life. Only when the individual becomes of ultimate importance, as in civilization, does time seem frighteningly linear. And as a result, the end of an individual's life seems like the end of the world. So does the end of a civilization. But in the end, one of the lessons Gilgamesh's tale seems to teach is the same one that the gods attempt to tell Gilgamesh about when they announce to him the sad news that he is not immortal. Your death is the end of you. It is not the end of the world. The end of nature, on the other hand, would be. The only comfort Gilgamesh and Enkidu can have now is that fame and those walls which stand as monument may give some sense of immortality. But even this is deceptive. What I want to leave you with today is a poem from a much more recent era, it's Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my deeds, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. In 1818, when the poem was published, England was in the throes of what became known as the Industrial Revolution. Beyond that, the expansion of the empire in India was continuing apace, and both slavery and Western expansionism were in full swing in America. These events were about resource extraction, wealth, agriculture, industry, status, luxury, civilization. They were also, and all colonial expansion, empire building, and civilization continues to be about ecological devastation, impoverishment, pollution, oppression, death. in a way that is more succinct but somehow no less profound than the Epic of Gilgamesh, tells us that civilization, in its beginnings and even at its height, always seems to know that it has a terminal point. 
It's the end of the world as we know it. But that's not the same as the end of the world. Thank you.